Hi, everybody. I think everybody's uh, joining right now. I've got uh, nine participants, so I'm going to wait about uh, two more minutes. Uh, while, um, while we're waiting, uh, make sure you have your email open. I've already sent the first assignments. Uh, already earlier this week, I sent um, a, uh, a lecture. Uh, I'm not going to give that lecture. So that was really the idea of background material and more of a uh, flipped uh, classroom design. Uh, a paper that is just uh, in case you're interested in reading about an application and uh, probably most importantly a getting started document uh, which gives you instructions for uh, downloading the software. So uh, gather the documents from your uh, email and then uh, we'll get started in a minute. And I also just started sharing my screen. And you'll see that first assignment that you all should have as well. All right, I think it's about time to uh, get started. Uh, now that I'm screen sharing, I see I don't have all of the controls uh, anymore that I um, have when I'm not. So I may now and then stop sharing uh, my screen so that I can reach all the controls. Um, we have, let me see if I can pull that up, a chat screen that you can use um, to, uh, and I see I have one chat. Okay, I have a chat box, so we can use that to uh, let me know if you want to say something. It sounds like uh, I'm the one that can uh, unmute you so that you guys can talk. Um, let's see, I may be able to allow for you to unmute yourself. Let me check. Well, I think what we'll do is if you can use the chat box, if you have a question or you uh, want to say something and then I can unmute you uh, right here 
from Kim, the, I uh, did just give everybody permission to unmute themselves. Okay. Okay. But they will need to do it if they want to talk. Okay. So that's handy. So you guys can unmute yourself if you want to. Um, the way I would like to do this, uh, you can see the, um, uh, the exercise that I've put up. I've put one slide up from the, uh, um, uh, the presentation that I've sent you. Um, the EcoPath with EcoSim software is designed to be uh, very user friendly. So what I would like to do today, instead of you guys following along uh, with me, uh, completing uh, values and parameters into a model, is that you build your own model and and really by doing that realize that it is uh you know something that you can easily pick up even if you don't have uh, a background in this um so i think um uh that there's a raise hand function as well but i'm not sure can any can somebody raise their hand so that i can see um if that works Okay, I see indeed uh, Sarah raising her hand. It looks like though, since I don't see everybody at the same time on the, the thumbnail, that it may be uh, handier just, just type in the chat box if you wanna say something or if you have a question, uh, because if you're not, I see Kira, Kira raising her hand. I think if I don't see you on the thumbnail, I may not realize your raised hand. So just type a message in the chat box if you have a question. Um, the uh, thing, I, uh, the only slide that I want to show from the presentation is up now. So this is a real brief overview of EcoPath with EcoSim. It has several different modules. EcoPath, which is really a mass balancing snapshot of your ecosystem then we have ecosim which uh once you have created that snapshot which we are going to do today you can do time dynamic simulations and then then there's eco space as well where uh, you create a grid and it becomes uh, spatially explicit and time dynamics are still in there as well then there's various plugins with which you can do other things you may be interested in um for the time that we have i'll only do ecopath and uh ecosim uh today so the first exercise is ecopath so if all is well i'll click on this you guys went to the website ecopath.org uh here you can already see right at the front that there's a new release this month so you guys uh, have a very new uh, version to work with so you can click on that or you can go to downloads where you can see that uh, there's uh, various updates so it's a very lively uh, community a community and there's constantly updates so make sure you have that may version of ecopath with ecosim and and there's uh, notes under here uh, what you need and i included that in the, in the uh, getting started document as well is there anybody uh, here that had a problem getting the software on their computer? Please uh, type it in the chat and I can, um, you know, unmute you or you can unmute yourself if you want to ask a question about that. All right, I so far don't see any messages, so that's a good sign. While we're on the website, uh, we also just decided to start a seminar series with the Ecopath Research and Development Consortium. And the next one is actually next week, May 26. So uh, if you're interested in learning more, sign up for that seminar uh, right here and there will be more to come. Uh, we'll do about six seminars a year, so you won't be flooded with them, but just the right amount to uh, to learn uh, new, uh, you know, new developments, new models, new applications, and so on. All right, so um, assuming everybody has the software, I'm going to close, close these two things out. 
Let's start with the exercise. So uh, reading this here, I would like to introduce you to the software, explore what data are required and build a simple model. Um, so we all have the software installed. So it's handy if you open this uh, Word file and that you can work on it on your own. So I would like you to just get started using these instructions. And what I've done to make this a group exercise is that throughout, I'll scroll down, you can see that I've highlighted sentences in yellow so that we can kind of see when everybody's at that uh, stage in working on their models. What I would like to do is if you are, if you read text and you do whatever is asked of you, you are at a highlighted sentence, uh, type uh, done in the chat and include a number. So this is the first one. So maybe done one. And then I know that you're here. Um, if I get multiple questions at the same time, I will uh, put uh, somebody that's done and indicates that they're okay with doing that, uh, uh, a person that's finished together with a person that has a question in a breakout room so they can help the other person through where they got stuck in completing the model. So whoever's at this first uh, yellow sentence why don't you guys type done one in the chat box so that i know this this is going to work all right and if you're not done uh type a or you have a question you know type that and i can unmute you or if you have a hard time with the chat box you do actually have the ability to unmute yourself so you can do that as well Great, I see the done, the duns coming in. Um, so uh, what you guys will do is create your own model. I've created it already, so don't worry. If you're really stuck or you don't feel like really typing stuff in, at the end of the first exercise, I will send you a cheat sheet with which you can check whether what you've done is correct. Uh, I'll also send you the model in case uh, you know it didn't work out at all. But like I said, uh, I would like you to really work on your own model. So for now, how about uh, you get started? Um, so start reading after the first uh, yellow highlighted line. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a second so that. Um, uh, I can more easily see your chats and whatnot. And uh, as soon as you have a question, you know, just put it in the chat and I can work through items. But I think it would be more interactive if you actually start doing it rather than just me doing it uh, up front. So if we're all uh, uh, okay with this, let's get started. If not, or if you have a question, just chat it to me or unmute yourself. And I'm going to stop sharing for a minute and let you guys work on that.
And if you just joined and don't know why it's quiet, just uh, put a question in the chat box and uh, I'll explain. So anytime you do want to go to the chat box, move your cursor to the bottom of the window, you'll see some options coming up. That's where you can enter the chat box and everybody's able to unmute uh, themselves. So you can just speak up if you want to as well. Another thing I've done in these assignments is I include it in blue if it is not really something you need to do to complete the assignment but just some more information and there's more of that in the second assignment that I'll send in a minute.
So I've put up the uh, basic input. So if all is well, it starts looking like uh, that um, sheet in your models right now. Uh, Rebecca has a question. You want to unmute yourself? Are you in edit and multi stanza? I can unmute you. Actually, it looks like you need to unmute yourself. So you're probably in edit multi stanza. Is that correct? Ah, uh, Rebecca, I see you're unmuted, so you can talk if you want. I don't hear you if you are talking, but I do see your um, microphone unmuted. Okay, uh, so maybe you have microphone issues. So uh, you're probably talking about this leading biomass. Um, uh, I think uh, you probably got a, a pop-up message when you click which of the groups uh, is the leading uh, Q to B and leading B. So yeah, that's fine. So if you're in that edit multi stanza groups, um, this is what you want it to look like, that you have a check mark on leading biomass with the adults mackerels and leading q to b with the adult mackerels so if you do that for the first time you can get pop-up messages just asking if it's really uh what you want to do uh so yeah yes it's good if you've put it on uh, adults So basically, um, till the first um, highlighted um, sentence, this is the uh, spreadsheet that you are completing after creating the groups. Uh, the only thing to think about is that for the macros, you have to click this edit multi stanza right here to get this little pop up window so that you can start entering the multi stanza. So multi stanza really means breaking a species in different age classes. So we have two age classes here, a juvenile and an adult. Um, and there you can then uh, include uh, different mortalities for those groups. Uh, and the leading group really determines, so they're uh, connected with a von Bertalanffy growth curve. So that's why here you select which one's leading, which is the adults in this case. Um, and then the biomass of the juveniles gets determined based on the biomass of the adults. So that's when you uh, click calculate to make sure that basically the grayed out boxes get completed by the software. And then you can say, okay.
and there's uh, abbreviations in the um, uh, in the assignments. Not all of them are super intuitive. Consumption is a Q, for example. So the P to Q ratio, you're asked for that for three groups. That is this production over consumption ratio. Now what I'll do while you're working on this, especially since we just had a, a new person joining, is send you an email uh, with an Excel file uh, where you can actually paste from Excel. So that's another good tip when you start building these things. Uh, where each of these sheets that need data, I have them uh, saved as um, Excel files and exceed and I see some people are are done with that first sheet so uh, especially if you start reading further um, uh, and again if you're not done but it's because you're stuck and you have a question just post it in the chat uh, if you are done you can continue on on to defining our fishing fleets so we've been in basic inputs so far um, but there's a fishery right here as well. So if you click that to expand, you can define your fleets here. So you see a define fleets button. I've already done it, so you see in here. And then we can continue on to uh, landing. So you'll definitely need to define your fleets in your model, but then I'll, I'll send an Excel file that has uh, some of the data that you can paste in from basic inputs and landings and, and, and we'll get to a diet later. So when you're continuing on, you know, you can just um, say when you're done at this point, we've done two as a, a bunch of you are doing right now. And then you can continue on and say done three and I'll stop sharing my screen for a second to uh, send you an email with some extra information.
All right, since I've or already had prepared that email, uh, you'll see it will have multiple attachment, um, even the model already. Uh, but what will be useful right now is that Excel, I called it a, a cheat sheet, uh, where uh, you'll find each of these, um, I'll share my screen again. Each of these Ecopath spreadsheets are a sheet in that Excel file, so you can grab that and more easily paste some stuff in. What you see, for example, on basic inputs, uh, if it's, um, uh, yeah, I would say blacked out, it's not completely blacked out, but you can see it's grayed out. Um, that won't paste like this. So for those multi-stanza groups right here, for example, you do need to go to multi-stanza and enter it yourself. But other things, like landings, for example, should be easy to paste in. Uh, pay attention to see if it ends up correctly. Sometimes it doesn't when we have these extra uh, grayed out rows in there uh, that, that show your, uh, your multi-stanza groups. And again, if you're not done and want some help, just put it in the chat and, uh, and I can help you. Or if it's multiple people at the same time, or you want to talk to somebody else who's already done, I can create breakout groups. So um, if you are stuck on things and it's hard to uh, keep up, the email actually also has this model that I'm showing on my screen right now. So there is a model in the, as an attachment that will um, have, you know, um, uh, everything completed. So, uh, if you're catching up, maybe you have some trouble with the software or anything like that, you know, you're not uh, lost for the entire session. So as soon as you're uh, caught up, uh, you can just grab the, uh, the model from the last email I send you, open that, and you'll be uh, basically at the end of the first exercise. So uh, if you're working through the exercise, um, you know, you can just get it from the uh, word file itself, which, uh, whichever values to complete, or you can grab the Excel file, which is also an attachment to your email uh, and, and a little bit more easily complete these, uh, uh, these sheets of the Ecopath model. So I think most of you are in fishery right now. So you've defined your fleets. You have landings right here. There's prices here. Um, what you may have noticed, I'm talking about dollars in the assignment. You can see euros here. 
you can actually uh, specify that. So if you were to go to model parameters, there's a monetary unit here. And you can choose yours. So here, so this is on euros. You can go to uh, uh, US dollars. And what you'll notice once you do that and you go back to these prices, now they're in US dollars. So um, it's not going to do any conversions for you. So if you have numbers in there, the number will stay the same. So this is just for yourself. So you've indicated what units are you working in. So looking at the assignment, we're actually working in uh, dollars. So this would be the appropriate way uh, to do that. So if you are done with the fleets, the next one is diets. Um, if you're done early, like Cassie, uh, you know, you may want to enter these uh, and have everybody else catch up. But if you are one of the later ones, this is a perfect one to uh, cut and paste from the Excel file that I sent. And this works the other way around too. So if you've created a diet matrix, so I'm showing a diet matrix right here. If you click on this little square here, you've selected the whole thing. You can copy it. You know, you can just right click and copy uh, and, and paste it in Excel. And, it comes in handy uh, to, to do that, especially once you're developing these models, you're gonna make changes and you wanna keep track of the changes that you make. And just now and then, instead of continuously saving versions of your model, you may just wanna save uh, your diet matrix of, or another, uh, any of these spreadsheets. So it's very compatible with Excel. You can just paste it in Excel and you'll have a record of that. So when you look at these diets in the table in the assignment right here, what you will see in the model itself is that you also have a row, row called sum in here. And just for handy for you, I want minus sum. So these, mo these, these values are proportions. So we have our groups right here. So I hope uh, everybody's there that you have your groups uh, in, in the, uh, in your model, these numbers refer to the exact same groups. So what you're completing here is here, your whales are the predator. What proportion of each of these other groups are in their diet? And it always has to sum uh, to one. So this one minus sum is handy for you. So you see what you're lacking and you can complete it. Um, so as I've included in the assignment, uh, you know, there's a lot of data going into these type of things. So you actually get from uh, stomach content analysis or uh, um, uh, probably literature review for a lot of your groups, like what are these organisms eating? And the proportions can obviously be tricky. So. Uh, you know, if you look at one stomach, it's not like they're going to exa exactly eat the same proportions every day. So you need a lot of stomachs. Um, you have in your basic inputs, you have the biomass of each of these groups in your model. So it may make sense, for example, for a species that is kind of a, a generalistic feeder, to have them eat, that to have the proportions kind of follow the biomasses. So if an organism, a fish, eats anchovy as spray and shrimp as spray, and you see that you have a lot more anchovy biomass and shrimp in your model, 
you can uh, and you know they're actually pretty indiscriminate and they're probably going to encounter a lot more ancient vegans just because there's more of there you can incorporate that knowledge into your diet so there's several ways to go about it and you can imagine that there's not one exactly true answer it's just what these organisms are eating um, you do want to make sure let's go back to the diet composition that if there is an organism that is an important component of a diet of of any of your uh your predators in there it has to be a group in your model because you cannot incorporate that information in your model if that diet item is not in there so if you've developed a model and now you look at what your organisms are eating and you see that there's a species there that is an important prey item for one of your species you've got to add them you know go back to uh, defining your groups and add that particular diet item so you want to make sure that all that is accounted for in your model you can see though that there's an import right here if you uh and and this is especially important not just because you don't want to add a group but if you know that they're feeding outside of your model area so you have a concept of what your model area is um if they're eating outside of that then your import line item would be appropriate all right, I see a lot of you are getting uh, towards the end of, of building your own model. So that's good. Uh, if you're kind of catching up, you know, make use of that Excel file, or even if you wanna just uh, follow along, open uh, the model that's also an attachment um, in, the, uh, in the email, and, and you can see the uh, completed model. So, once we've done all the inputs, this is a mass balance model. This, what that means is that at least over a period of time, and we usually determine, uh, and in this model too, that to be a year, uh, your inputs equal your outputs. So, um, to, um, and, and all these items, so how much biomass you have, how much landing there are of each of these groups, what their diets are, uh, really um, are incorporated in that mass balance equation. So when you're done at the end of this, um, uh, when you've completed all your, uh, your data here, you wanna click basic estimates and it's going to mass balance. Now, if it is, of course, I fed you these numbers and it does mass balance, <laughs> that is not going to happen normally on your first try. So if you're here at done four, where you've completed everything, you click mass balance. Um, the next uh, thing you can do is try changing some of the outputs and see what happens. Don't save it uh, because if uh you know if you just change some values in the basic inputs uh you uh, maybe massively increase uh, the landings you may not actually end up with a mass balance model anymore um but it's a very uh, handy uh thing that ecopath does for you uh for example what it what it tells you if you have an error message when you click those basic estimates uh, is that um, there's too much of a group consumed than there's present uh, in the system. So uh, basically you have not found a possible solution to what's going on in that system. So it's very handy that it gives you that warning and, and, and that you have to adjust something. The warning that you will see if there's too much of a group consumed and present in the system is that the ecotrophic efficiency is too high. So the ecotrophic efficiencies, if I scroll up over here, for the most part, we let determine by ecopath. So what that is, is uh, it tells you what proportion of that group 
is actually used in the system so true consumption or or, or, or fishing uh, and is not just dying of, of old age uh, which you know doesn't often happen uh, for uh, invertebrates or, or or fish species maybe at uh, higher trophic levels like the whales and seals that that can happen so marine mammals may have a very low ecotrophic efficiency but if you go down they probably get pretty high and high uh, is one one is that uh, everything gets used in the system um, and so it's some proportion of one if you have an ecotrophic efficiency above one that's when your model won't balance because more of that group is used in the system than that is actually there. So you'll have to reduce some use of that group or increase the turnover rate of that group or maybe increase the biomass of that group. So that is basically kind of your help parameter, the ecotrophic efficiency. So you can see we've only completed it for one. So when you were uh, uh, entering all the biomasses of each of these groups, uh, we left the bentos empty. So basically you may have a group for which you just don't know what the biomass is. Then it's handy that we have this ecotrophic efficiency because now if you complete that, it will calculate it for you because what it will do is say, well, if this much of that group is used in the system and it knows all the diets and maybe uh, fishing removal that you've included in there, how much biomass would you need to make that happen? So with basic estimates, that was calculated uh, for us. So uh, this ecotrophic efficiency isn't truly measurable. Uh, there are some estimates of what's normal, uh, you know, for these groups. Uh, so here we have the anchovy, for example, so that's a low trophic uh, level fish, high turnover. There's a lot of predators. Uh, there's uh, maybe a fishery on it. We can, we can check that if there are anchovy landings. Yes, there's anchovy landings by the, uh, this forager fleet here. So basically it is normal or acceptable or to be expected that that ecotrophic efficiency is very close uh, to one. Um, so I would say for bentos, that is a group where we don't often know the biomass. Uh, I often, and there's a literature that, that, that kind of converges on saying that's 0 0.8. So this is a bit of a low estimate here. Uh, but that's often used for bentos, uh, for example. But uh, because it's not really measurable, it's very important to actually have data on biomass. This is something we can measure in the field, right? How much biomass do you have in it of any group? So, uh, so that one is an important one to try and have. So. Uh, sometimes when you build these models, uh, they're very much based on a lot of field data. You may actually, you know, need to do some experiments to get to, uh, uh, you know, consumption to biomass ratios. Or you may need to go out in the field and, and get a, an idea of the population size of whales. So there can be a lot of time involved in, in getting a good model. And luckily, you know, there's other people doing that as well. So do a good literature search and, and you'll find a lot of this uh, information in there. So um, I see a lot more people um, uh, getting done. Uh, and again, if you're not, you know, make use of the Excel file or grab the finished model. Uh, I want to uh, at least show uh, usually what I do is build an ecopath model because I'm interested in uh, the more dynamic components. You know, you want to model through time what happens if you increase fishing or something else changes or you want to go in space and look at how the distribution changes when something changes in the field. But the ecopath model, one that we just built itself, is an output as well. So if we are to go to tools, of Ecopath, we can see that we've now determined the pools and the flows of biomass in our case of this system. 
And that's, you know, we have a quantified system right now. So you have an ecopath flow diagram, for example, as your output. And in this case, you know, the, the fleets are included as well that, that we've created. And you can see these lines are the flows, uh, the y-axis are trophic levels, so that your primary producers are in trophic level one, and you go up from there. Um, oh, uh, let me pause for a second because I have a question in the um, uh, in the uh, in the chat box about the ecotrophic efficiency of seals. The bioaccumulation was negative. Um, yeah, if you go to other production. Um, uh, maybe try to change those rates again. So what we've included in this exercise is um, basically showing that a mass balance model is not equal to a steady state model. You can have um, increasing and decreasing um, um, groups in there that's already indicating your ecopath model. Oh, and I think uh, Kira has actually solved her problem yet, but, but let me uh, continue on this train of thought. Um, it could actually be the case. So if we wouldn't include these uh, increasing wells and decreasing seals on this other production uh, sheet in bioaccumulation, your model actually doesn't uh, balance. Um, so it doesn't have to be the case that every uh, inputs and outputs are equal because we do have this uh, biomass accumulation rate option uh, right here. So that is, let me see um, where I put that in the assignment. Which includes diet. Oh yeah, so that's right after you're done, uh, right before you're done three. Um, so we can actually model declining populations and recovering populations. So you don't have a steady state model and that is this right here. So you may indeed have a problem balancing your model if you haven't included that. So if you did balance your model, you've got the flow diagram right here. Um, you can get a lot of, of uh, statistics calculated from the pools and flows that you've included in your model. So check out the statistics right here uh, and, and in some of the keynotes and also in a network analysis um, clinic yesterday that you may or may not have participated in. You've heard terms such as total system throughput, uh, just uh, different calculations of the flows through your model. Uh, those are all calculated in uh, Ecopath as well. And if we go to the network analysis plugin, a lot of these are based on the theory of Bob Ulanowicz, who was the last keynote speaker of yesterday. And you can go through all these outputs and see, um, uh, you know, what the ascendancy of the system is. So how efficient is this system? How efficient does uh, energy flow through this system? Or is there some redundancy that, that can be seen by, uh, uh, by the overhead, for example? Uh, let me see another one that he uh, included. Um, uh, the Lindemann spine, for example. So here we have uh, your phytoplankton and your detritus group. Um, uh, and here you can see what each of these lines uh, represent. The total system throughput as a percentage is right here. Total biomass here. Your total respiration from that particular group. Uh, consumption, you know, of this group by this group. Uh, predation, so consumption for the other end, uh, right here. Um, so you can, so you can. All this is created automatically um, for you um, uh, once you've uh, successfully balanced your model. 
I do see one uh, problem um, uh, that uh, from Sarah that her ecopath model populates fine, but the statistics tab is all zeros. Um, did your basic estimates uh, work out fine as well? And you can unmute uh, if that's easier. Because you will indeed see if you start changing, and I did ask you to do that, try changing some of the output and see what happens. If you start changing in a fashion that um, unbalances your model, your statistics become zero. It's not going to be able to calculate any of these um, uh, outputs of these net ecological network analysis outputs when you do not have a balanced uh, model. So this only works with your balanced model. So if you did make some changes and you didn't save it, you could just close that model and open the model you saved again, or you know change the values back to, if you remember, to, uh, to what it was from the assignment and balance again by basic estimates and then your uh, statistics should uh, populate. Um, I think a lot of you are at this point where the, uh, you created your full model. Um, you can put in the chat right now um, if you have uh, any issues or you want any help before we move uh, forward. I do see um, Sarah saying that um, everything was populated. Uh, did, uh, did you, uh, can you click basic estimates, Sarah, and see what happens? And then Kira still getting an arrow of uh, biomass accumulation. I think it's, is it just a pop-up window? Because I think you can say, okay, uh, when I create a new model, uh, when, and, I, and I put in uh, any value in biomass accumulation, I always get a warning screen that that's what's going on. And I say, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> and then uh, it, it will allow me to uh, continue with one. So it will give you, if you uh, start a model, especially if you grab the model that I've created already, if you start a model that has anything in biomass accumulation, especially if it's negative, you will get a warning message to just alert you of that. So is anybody else is having that problem that Kira is having? Uh, because we all have that negative biomass accumulation of the seals in there. Um, while um, it's, it's only Kira that is getting uh, uh, basically stopped by the software from continuing. So um, yeah, so others have completed it probably here in the biomass accumulation and they said, well, when we changed it to BA rate, then it worked. So that could be the case for you as well, uh, Kira. If you look at the, uh, uh, what I have up right now, make sure they're over here. So, so included in the BA rate over year column right here. So while Kira is looking whether that is working, you can see all these little arrows. We have a lot of information now here. You can click those. Uh, and kind of get rid of all that. So um, and then we'll look at EcoSim. Right now, all you want to do once you've created an EcoPath model is just run your EcoSim and see what happens. 
So I've already messed a little bit <laughs> with it. So you'll see that that's in there. But you guys will see. Let me see if I can undo my time series actually. Uh, I've already included some time series. So that is going to give you a different result. What you guys will see is if you wouldn't have anything in biomass accumulation, you basically get a straight line. What you guys will see is that everything else is a straight line, but um, your whales are going to uh, go up a little bit and your seals are going to go down a little bit. So um, if all is well, that's what you show. I already continued on with the second exercise, so I'm seeing some results from that uh, right now. Um, but uh, check out your run. It should look like a straight line in the middle and then maybe one up and, and one down. So uh, oftentimes you don't have anything completed in biomass accumulation. Um, uh, and then this is just a handy trick to see, you know, do I have a straight line? There shouldn't be anything happening yet if I, if I have that uh, ecopath model without anything changing through time in ecosim. So if it doesn't and you look into it, what happened? And in my case, for example, it was loading some time series that you all will do in a second. Um, but uh, and if you do have biomass accumulation, you know, even though you may have a group increasing or decreasing, if it was negative, it should stabilize. So just look at whether you have a stabilizing uh, lines here. Uh, and, and again, if you don't have any changes in biomass accumulation, it should be a straight line altogether. Um, all right, Kira still has some problems. It may be the case that it didn't, um, just removing those values from the wrong column, maybe um, that didn't work out right. I think since you are uh, got really far except for that, maybe Kira, for you, um, the best solution is just to grab the answer of eBay Ecopath uh, model that has everything uh, completed. Um, so what I'll do, so we've been in an hour for now. If you can um, put any questions, they could be about anything else, not just that you have problems populating it, but maybe now that you build a model, you're curious about certain things, uh, put them in the chat box and we can talk about that briefly. Uh, this is also a good time to, uh, you know, use the Excel file to check your values, is everything in order, or just load the Ecopath model that I've included in the email and, and that you are at this uh, stage as well. Because what I have added to that um, email too is your next exercise where we're going into ecosim and fit your data uh, or fit time series so actual data uh, and 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 have your model uh, replicate um, field data which is something that you want uh, to always do if you want to do anything time dynamic with these uh, ecopath that exist in models So Rebecca has a possible solution for Kira in the chat box as well, is to put zeros back into the accumulation column. So it could um, accidentally retain some wrong information uh, if you included that in there. So uh, for everybody else, I think we can have a um, just a five minute break to either catch up, um, you know, still, you know, if you have a question, put it in the chat box. I'll keep monitoring that. 
So in, for the next five minutes, you can either catch up or, uh, and or switch to uh, assignment two. So go to your email. The second assignment in there looks like this. Let me drag it over where um, we're going to fit some time series to Anchovy Bay. Uh, you can already, I've also added a CSV file to your email. Save that on your computer because uh, you're going to need that. That's the file that contains the data, the time series data that we're going to use to fit the model to. All right, so we'll start with the second assignment or exercise in um, so four minutes from now. But keep the questions coming if you have any. All right, so I see somebody has difficulty finding the assignments. Let's send another email. So I have um, on this email that is coming in right now, you'll see the second assignment in Word. I also already put um, an um, finished model where I did some fitting already in there. Um, I would recommend um, if you want to start with an already populated model to grab the model that I called Anchovy Bay Ecopath so that you can, you know, load the CSV file and, and so on. Um, uh, but uh, with the email I just sent out, um, uh, I've called Anchovy Bay Ecosim. 
uh, that has everything already in it. Um, I did some fitting with that uh, already. All right, I see uh, Kira is out of trouble because she said uh, done six right now. So, all right, let's get started on that second uh, assignment. Uh, Richard, did you find, uh, did that email arrive that I just sent where I put the assignment in again? Great. So for the second assignment again, uh, we're going to use the ecosystem model that you've just uh, constructed. Um, and we're gonna fit it to time series data. So basically uh, field observations, fisheries, catches, and so on. Um, let's see. Oh, it could be a uh, Rebecca sees a discrepancy from what's described in the doc. It could be the blue. Uh, so you mean probably the blue. Um, I think the, the one that I put in there is actually an update from what's included in the blue text. So the blue text, I just described some example of um, when you do this in your own model, what the kind of the setup of a, of a uh, CSV file should look like. Uh, I've updated the exercises from something that Billy created, so it may not be exactly as what you see right here. It should be exactly as what you see right here. So this is the, I have the CSV file up right now. Let me double check. It could be different from here. Uh -huh. It's not actually. But then we don't see the whole thing per se. Do you, uh, is this what you're, what you're seeing though, uh, Rebecca? Okay. So what you, what you guys saw in my run in my model is not going to look like uh, what you'll see yet. Um, uh, I didn't revert back to uh, not having done the ecosystem assignment already. So I couldn't show you exactly what it looks like. So I try to describe it to you by memory, but um, uh, this is what it was going to look like after you uh, include some of these time series. So let's not worry too much about that. If you don't know if what you saw here when you press run looked like what it should look like. If you had a balanced model after your basic estimates, you should be in good shape. Um, so let's go to the exercise here. I see that some of you are already right here. So what, um, what you do before this uh, highlighted area is just reading in that CSV uh, file. So you go to time series, you grab those anchovy bay temp time series. So in your case, you're importing it they're in there so basically if you look at the time series grid see this is the same one you see basically that's a couple of ones here and then 0 0.75, 0 0.5, 0 0.25. So yeah, this looks about right with the uh, uh, the CSV file that we loaded. So is everybody able to upload this CSV file? So. 
So once you've uploaded it, you can read through the blue. It doesn't really uh, change. Uh, it's not an as part of the assignment, really. Uh, what you'll see here is some uh, information about how, uh, and you can include this in other ways as well. So we have time series, what we can use to uh, fit the model, but you can also start including some um, uh, environmental functions here. So you see temperature here. Uh, we don't have enough time to really uh, start playing with that, so uh, so I haven't included it as an exercise. But you can, for example, have temperature in your model and have your species uh, respond to temperature in different ways through response curves, so like tolerance uh, curves. Uh, here, uh, I'm not going to work with this one for this short time that we have either the dummy variable is a way to include primary production, but maybe in this case, you don't know how much that is. You can actually use the model to try and change your primary production in such a way that it best fits um, the secondary production that is seen in the model. So there's a lot of things you can do with these CVS files when you load them. Uh, you could also just include, you know, your landings from your trawlers, for example, your different biomass uh, values, and then in your model, you can see, so here we have the time series grid, you see that none of those environmental variables are coming back here. You can include them over here, so for example, that's temperature, that's loaded is going to show up as a forcing function over here. You can also here with add and remove, uh, you can add more forcing functions with values. You can paste in uh, your temperature values right here. So there's several ways to include that information. So for this exercise, we're just going to work with fitting your, uh, your, um, your time dynamic um, uh, model run to your, your time series. All right, so some of you, uh, most of you are at six now. Uh, some of you are uh, on to uh, and, and, and are done with seven. Um, so we've loaded those time series. Um, so they show up right here once you did. If you now do a run with your ecosim model, what you'll see is these little dots show up. Those are your time series. So um, your model, um, probably actually what you guys already see right now is kind of like this. So your model uh, runs, you have your time series, and um, uh, you can look at your model output in different ways. So after you have a run, you can uh, separately look at your group. So if you click on a group name here, you can even just use your down arrow, which is what I'm doing right now. You can go through the different groups. You can see that your time series and your model run will have the same color. You can also see we didn't include time series for all your groups, so they're not going to have anything in there. And I'll get into as well how what you really want to try and do is have as much time series as possible because that will be your most realistic model. So you're pretty limited if you only have a few time series, which is actually what we have in this example. Outside of this run ecosim window, you can go and show your group plot, so you see various um, information about your, your group. So we're looking at whales right now, for example. So we have some seals information here. What you see, if you've loaded time series, they're also gonna show up here. So here we have in blue your time series and your model. So you can see your model is not doing a very great job right here of fitting this time series. Um, so we have a few other ones. So you definitely want to do some fitting here.
So, and it indeed indicated. Uh, so the way your model set up right now. So what's happening, for example, with the seals is they used to actually fish for them and then they stopped doing that. So that is what your time series, you can see that here too, is indicating. So this is fishing effort it's dropping off and then it's gone right so there's not fishing for seals anymore in our model so your uh according to your data that really increases the biomass of your seals and your model is really not quite capturing that so we could try and see what is changing that so the way we're going to fit our model is changing the vulnerability settings in your um, in the model. What that is, so I'll click your vulnerabilities right here. These values right here are vulnerability exchange rates. So if you looked at the um, uh, the presentation in advance of the clinic, um, in in the model, there's the foraging arena theory. And in that is that prey items are present in vulnerable and invulnerable states. So you cannot always consume everything that's present um, uh, because basically in real life, uh, prey uh, is usually in hiding. Um, so this exchange rate is also one of those parameters that is not really measurable is kind of our main target uh, when we're fitting. So maybe uh, there's a, a, we have our group set up in such a way that they just can't really uh, consume enough of their prey items to increase their biomass enough. So we can start changing that uh, or let the model change that based on the uh, field data that you're providing uh, the model. So, um, I see some people done at seven. Are there any questions or are, uh, is anybody stuck in trying to get at least the, um, uh, the, the file uh, located? So even if you grab uh, a model that I provided to you, you at least want to load the time series to, to be able to continue with the exercise. So. Um, you know, if you go to your uh, uh, time series the first time, you see that you can um, you can load one, uh, either import one, or if you grabbed my uh, EcoSim model, you can just click on the one um, uh, that was um, called Anchovy Bay Temp. So make sure you click on that and load it so that you do at least get, you know, when you run EcoSim, uh, that you do get these little dots, which shows your time series is loaded. Uh, is there anybody that does not have that, not have any time series loaded, no dots showing up when they run EcoSim? All right, seeing nothing in the chat, you know, if you're kind of looking into it still, just put that in the chat. But uh, if I don't see anything, I'm going to assume people have these time series in there. Uh, so let's start fitting. Um, so if you go to EcoSim, let's go to the vulnerabilities. So those, those with this little column right here. Um, so set it all to two. So to do that quickly, you know, you can set the whole thing. You say apply to, you can do that per column as well or per, per cell, but that would be the quickest way because we get started. That's kind of like the default uh, before we start fitting and changing these. So we can actually, we have an automated fit to time series. You can imagine, and I put some information here, that you can start trying out different numbers yourself as well and kind of see that's what I did here. You can show multiple runs when you do run ecosim. You could just change some values, run ecosim and see what's changing, right? So 
we can actually do that one time real quick. So let's say of our seals, right? Uh, all these twos, let's make them um, a high value. And now we're gonna and just put it on seals. So we are here right now. Let's show some multiple runs. Run it. So let's just look at seals. We can see in run one, it was not following your biomass at all. Run two, it's trying to get there. So if we do all, you can see in both. So that helps um, to increase that. So you can do this stuff manually, but you may not um, you know, have the knowledge of what uh, to put in there. So you can set them all at two and use the fit to time series um, in tools. There's multiple tools here and this tools and we will actually use the vulnerabilities as what will be changing during this search. So it's going to change your vulnerabilities by 1% and just try, or the, the model does, uh, to find the lowest sums of square. So that's the deviation from your model line from the uh, data points uh, and, 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 um, and, and find the best uh, solution. So, what you see here, these are the, um, uh, the groups again that we have in here. Um, so uh, if we're, we're at point two now here, you select the vulnerability search. That's what we're on right here. Uh, you can start with, with doing one block. So that's number of blocks right here. And uh, if you click this sensitivity of the sums of squares to V, we're going to go by predator and say search. If you go by predator, it is going to do a whole column and say OK. And it's just going to change your vulnerabilities here. Um, so I put in here, yes, we go to the search. So when they say search here, that's this search right here. We'll see your iterations here. This SS is your sum of squares. It's going to go down on each iteration. If it asks you, it has converged, it's not going to find a better solution. Do you want more iterations? You say no. Um, let me give a little bit more room. Sorry. So that we can see the whole output screen right here. So what you get is your sum of squares right here, and it will and your your AIC, your so your Akai key information criteria, and it's going to with your new search is going to add uh, all your searches right here. So let's you know go to two blocks for example and search by predators is going to find the two most of where the uh, vulnerabilities are most sensitive. Um, so we'll actually have the biggest change in our sums of squares by changing these vulnerabilities. And you'll press another search. So your sums of squares have go down, gone down, which is good. Your Ikaiki information, information criteria has gone down, which is good. So um, you can continue on with this. I'm going to go and go, let's see how far you guys are. Uh, you could do this, you know, a block further and further. Let me go to say 11 blocks. We got 11 right here. Predators, 
search. So what I did now, I just did all of them. So then, you know, which, uh, which of these interactions are most sensitive to, uh, are the vulnerabilities in the interactions are most vulnerability or most sensitive to changes in the sums of squares is not really something I'm finding an answer to yet because it's because I've selected all of them. Uh, I say okay, and I'm going to search. It's going to go down again. Um, something I did put in here and I didn't do actually is uncheck reset Vs on the run. This one I find really important if you have a very complex model. What it does, what you can see now is I did a search here and I'm going to do a search again. It starts at the sums of squares that we had at the beginning, that 9.5 again. Uh, in these, any type of these type of searches for the lowest sums of squares, you can kind of get stuck in local minima. So what's better is if, if you came down to a sums of squares of 3.9 is to say, don't reset the vulnerabilities on the run. So you uncheck this. What happens then is instead of starting at the 9.5 again and doing everything over again, it's going to start at the 3.1. So you can really find different ways in which to find the best fit, um, but continuing on to where you've left off with the sums of squares instead of starting over again and again. So this is checked by default. Um, which uh, I don't think is, is necessarily a, the logical decision. So uncheck this. And what then happens is, is that you continuously go on with the lowest solution in some of the squares that you found here. Um, let's see. So a lot of people are getting done at seven. So, um, uh, so you kind of together with me are, are doing this. So what I've put in here is just increase the steps from one to two to three to four and so on and so on until we're at 11. I did 11 right away. Um, so, uh, so one way or the other, you may all be here. Uh, you can now uh, go to your run eco sim and run it and and i you can unclick this if you want but it may be interesting to show what's what's changed here right so we now go to say your seals you can see run three run four you can see that there's an improvement, right? It looks pretty good now. Um, so you can go through all these, see kind of what changes occurred with your fitting procedures. A good way to check that out as well is just to go to all fits. So we see here that the, they're all doing a pretty good job in, in following these, um, uh, these observations. Uh, we're pretty limited. We didn't have a lot of observations. So you can see that is one problem. You know, if you have a lot of uh, groups in a model, you want to really want to have time series for as much of these groups as you can. Um, another problem that I want to point out is that if we are to go back to fit the time series and you uh, especially the iterations, really what this does is finding the smallest uh, sums of squares, but at least we have also get this information of the AIC, but it's not using them from the, for the fit. And as you probably all know, the lower the AIC, the better. So we now see a very low sums of squares, so that's great, but we see a high AIC. So what this 
most of the time indicates is that we've overfitted the model. We really have a really high AIC. So there's a lot more parameters in there that shouldn't be in there. Um, and, and what I want to show you with doing this exercise where we have, you know, a pretty nice low sums of squares, but a, a high AIC. And then in the next one, uh, we're going to uh, look at what if we also pay attention to AIC. So um, let's read this little part here. It's easy to overfit models if you include all groups, which we just did, including the ones you don't have data for. So we've even included groups in the fitting now we didn't even have time series for. There's no real stopping when those vulnerabilities are changed. There's no real stopping uh, what value it ends up on. There's not even a time series to look at. So if we look at vulnerabilities, you know, we've got some pretty high numbers in here. Uh, so you can see it doesn't even fit in the column. This is the actual value. We don't know whether that makes any sense, especially for the ones we don't have time series but we're not necessarily going to see that in the fit. So this is something you may publish and everything looks fine. Um, but um, your model may not perform very well. So what you often want to do is you, after you fit a model to time series, so that's data in the past, you may want to do some simulations into the future. So let's uh, go to Ecosim parameters. And this is the duration that's automatically set because of the time series you loaded. So this is the amount of years you had time series for at least one for. Let's set this to 100. I'm gonna undo this for a minute. Let's run Ecosim. Um, so you can see our data ends here. This is what our model's doing. You know, it may be exactly right, but we definitely don't know. And, and for example, whales, we don't even have time series for whales. They're going uh, up by a lot uh, with the vulnerabilities that we included. We have our cod is crashing in 2020. Our whiting is crashing in 2050. So we've a lot, we have a lot going on and we don't necessarily know uh, whether that's true because we've been fitting uh, all these groups that we didn't even have time series for. So even though your fit looks really good, I guess is the message I'm trying to convey, um, your model may not be great. So if you then use that model and project forward, you may come up with these, you know, uh, um, expectations or, or proclamations even like oh god we'll all uh, collapse in 2020 uh, you know which is today uh, and your whiting will all collapse in 2050 so let's be a little bit more careful in our fitting which is what I'm trying to do with our next step um, so you can reset your vulnerabilities right here back to two to try this process over again you can also, when you go to fit the time series, uh, say here, let's reset them on the run. Um, also, uh, you'll get a pop-up message. Do you wanna reset your vulnerabilities to two? Uh, you've probably had it um, before that you got that pop-up message where I said here, like select no when you see that. Um, here we're gonna say yes, especially at the start, you know, we do want to uh, um, reset the vulnerabilities to the default of two. So what we're gonna do now, instead of searching all groups, let's start with searching the groups with time series. So here's my little pop-up message, reset vulnerabilities to a default of two. Yes, my, um, uh, um, uh, vulnerabilities are all set to two again. So you can check that, you can see that that's true. Uh, apparently, I only have data here for these. 
so uh, so let's only search there. And and what is even a better approach? So this is just a convention, I would say, is to select one block less than what you have time series for. So we have three. Well, we really only want to look for two blocks. So here we just kind of get into the more conservative way of, of fitting. Um, so we can search. Actually, what I did is just to uh, first we started actually with just search the group with time series would be your first step. So we are going to reset the Vs on the runs and search. So it's a multi-step uh, process. So first step I did was, well, let's just look at the groups, but the whole column of the predator where we have time series for. Now to this question. So we have, you know, an okay-ish sums of squares, not as low as our last one. We have an okay uh, information criteria that if you compare it with the other ones, at least a lot lower again than our last one that we didn't trust so much. We basically overfitted. So now you want to say, well, we also still want to search for different blocks that are most are going to really uh, 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 changes in those vulnerabilities are going to have the most effects on our sums of squares. So now I would say you just want to do one block less than what you have time series for. Then click sensitivity of sums of squares to vulnerabilities. And then even we're going to do it per interaction. So by predator prey and say search. You can imagine with a big complex model, this is going to take forever. So there's some automation you can include here. We're just going to change these two and say, okay. Make sure this is unchecked now. We want to start at that 3.69, say search. And basically what you'll do, actually, this didn't really improve it that much. Basically what you want to do is um, repeat this, keep on searching. until your uh, sums of squares doesn't get any lower. But again, also pay attention to your uh, AIC. Now here too, so we're slowly going better. You can continue on with this. Um, you can paste, let's see. I have that easy here. Your vulnerabilities is another uh, column you can easily paste in. Um, so once you try these different routines, so you can kind of keep this up until this doesn't get any lower, this doesn't get any lower. We're pretty much trying a completely different routine than where we ended here in number three, right? So if you, reset everything to two and try a completely different strategies. You can go to vulnerabilities and save your vulnerabilities into Excel. So you kind of keep that run in a way. So um, I've did that here when I did that just by block a couple of times. So I have some vulnerabilities in here. I can just copy select the right area for my paste. 
So you can paste those vulnerabilities back in of a good run. So I've done that right now. Put the ecosystem parameters. Yeah, that's correct. Back to 41. Run ecosystem. So here, um, so you've been uh, continuously reducing. Uh, so what you can see in the Excel file is I came down to a sum of the squares of 3.14 and ASC of minus 29.44. There could be slight change differences in here, but you guys are probably pretty close to this uh, once you did that. Now what we'll see, and you can look through these again, but this is also an easy way to look at it. This is very similar to, um, to what we just saw. So it doesn't necessarily look like a much better fit, uh, but it's a similar fit. And as you can see, what I've put in the Excel file here is that the sums of squares were 3.1 on our overfitted situation. And we have like 3.14 in our, our pretty good situation. So, so the sums of squares is not really our telling point right here, it's the AIC. Um, so the fits are, not, are gonna look similar pretty much uh, than, than we just had. Uh, but your projections are going to at least be different. And even if we don't know, you know, which you never know with any of these simulations, and you pretty for sure know that you're not predicting the future, uh, but we're now more confident your ecosystem run, it's looking different. So for example, your whales are doing well, but they're not having that, that huge increase. They're stabilizing. We've got our cod, I mean, it's going down because our data says so, but it's actually uh, stabilizing as well. So even though we, you know, we never know for sure exactly what happens after we don't have data anymore, we can be more confident in this output because we didn't use, we only changed things where based on information. We didn't start changing a lot of things where we didn't have information for. So, so um, that's what I wanted to show you. So I'm right here now where I ran Ecosim for a hundred years. There's definitely a lot, a lot of other parameters that you can change. Uh, most of them not automatically in the fit to time series, uh, but there's definitely things that you can change to make better fits. Um, so I'll show some of them here. Um, one of them that is another automated fit is this anomaly search that you see right here. I'm not necessarily um, uh, a big fan of that one. What happens here is that uh, you can imagine uh, this uh, being used by fishery scientists that don't really have any data about the environment. They are just interested in particular species and they see a, a species increasing. Uh, there's, you know, with bottom-up uh, effects, there's, and you, and, but you don't know anything about primary production. There's a big chance if, especially low trophic level fishes start to increase in biomass, that there's just more food. So you can start changing your primary productivity. So, um, so here, for example, um, you can have, so let's say we have a, a primary production time series. So this is my approach really, that you actually have primary production data. But for example, with our dummy variable here, if we apply that forcing function, so here on the phytoplankton, you can start on the anomaly search. Um, so here now we see our dummy variable. You can put different spline points in there. You can basically ad adjust your primary production such that it starts explaining your secondary production. Uh, I would say it's, it's, you know, it's automated in there, it's used a lot. 
Um, I think in this group, a lot of people are interested in model coupling and that's what I generally do as well. So usually what I do, I either have somebody with a different model that has primary production output that loads into my model or I use data. So it is not necessarily something I want to have automatically changed to make my models fit better. So, but that is what that anomaly search uh, would do. So it may be suitable in some cases, especially if you just have no information about that primary production and it's pretty sure maybe in some upwelling area that there's probably such an increase in primary production, you just don't have the data that that would really explain your increase in biomass of your anchovy, this would be a good way to use, uh, to, to, to replicate that in your model and see. Uh, but that's another way to do it, or, or, or it's used in combination a lot. And then a lot of these parameters that I described here are things that you can change by hand in your model. You know, rerun, check if your fits are better. You can always see, in all fits what your sums of squares are and, and, and see if they go lower whenever you change something. So you can iteratively make changes in your model to make it fit your data better. And of course, you know, in our example, we had very little data, increase the number of time series and you'll have um, a, a more realistic uh, model. All right. Um, we have five more minutes, so any questions that you have, um, put them in the chat. I hope, of course, there's a lot of material that I made some choices that I think are useful to learn in just these two hours that we have. You now know how to build a model, what data you need when you wanna build one, and how you can make your model fit data and, and make it as realistic as possible. Um, so let me know what you think. Apparently the whole unmute thing doesn't work as well as we thought it did. I'm gonna do unmute all for a second. And then um, let me know uh, if you have any questions, any comments. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I can see you when you talk. If no more questions, comments, I'm probably gonna pop into the happy hour that is right after this um, uh, for a minute so I can chat further there uh, as well. Um, you know, you have the website uh, that will give you more information. There's courses that are way longer than two hours that you can look up and follow. Uh, there's a help uh, option in here where you can search uh, in the software itself for solutions to any issues you may have. Um, so if you're interested uh, in using this more, uh, you know, you're Welcome to join uh, the Ecopathologist. And um, that's it for now. And um, I hope you enjoyed it, learned something. And um, uh, I will maybe see you at, uh, at Ecopath uh, forums. I'll stay.